Thank you and good afternoon. I believe that stories have power. I believe that when we dare to tell our stories and when we truly listen to the stories of others, miracles and wonders take place. Let me tell you a story about an experience I had in my life, and I'll use it as a springboard for talking about the power of stories and the many ways they nurture our souls. So come with me back in time to 1987. That was a year of exciting new beginnings for our family. My wife gave birth to our first child, an adorable little girl. We named her Annie. But 1987 was also a year of incredibly sad endings. In the Montrose community where we lived, it seemed that every young man we knew, 20-year-old men, 30-year-old men, it seemed that every young man we knew was wasting away and dying, and it just seemed so wrong. The Walgreens Pharmacy on Montrose Boulevard, it's still there. During that era, it sold more AZT than any other drugstore in the United States. So we were in the middle of what would become one of the worst epidemics in American history. One day the phone rang. My friend said, I'm calling about Chelsea. He's taken a turn for the worse. So I said, we'll be there tonight. She said, I need to warn you, something has happened with his, with his mind. He won't even recognize who you are. And then she said, it's really bad. He was so looking forward to meeting your baby. Then she said, I need to warn you of something else. And she leaned into the phone and whispered and said, his mother, she's here. I said, that's a good thing, right? She's finally here? My friend said, is it? Imagine you're on your deathbed and your own mother won't even touch you. I said, I cannot imagine that. We just had this baby. That's all we want to do is to touch her and to hold her. So we went there that night, and this time we took our baby. And it was just as my friend had said. Chelsea was lying on his back on a hospital bed in the middle of his living room where the hospice volunteers had placed it. And his mother was in the room, technically, but she was in the corner of the room, as far from her son as she could possibly be and still be in the room. She was sitting on a folding chair. The chair wasn't even facing her son. It was turned sideways. And as for Chelsea, my friend was right about that too. He did not recognize us. But what was most shocking, we barely recognized him. You got to understand, he had been this tall, six foot five inch, good looking, happy go lucky, friendly, smart guy. And now he was as skinny as a person can be and still be alive. He was spiking a fever. They had taken off his shirt. You could see every bone. He had those awful sores in his mouth, and he kept licking them, trying to relieve the pain. And so that friendly face was replaced with a look of total anguish and pain. His breathing, every breath was a struggle, and you wondered if it might be the last. And as for his mind, there was nothing he said that made us think the old Chelsea was still there. He just sort of babbled. So we gave up trying to talk with him, and we stood around the bed and talked over him to each other. After a while, though, he started doing this one thing that made us think, well, maybe something of the old Chelsea is still there. He would glance over at our baby. He was too weak to turn his body, but he would look at her, and then he would jerk his eye back. And then he'd jerk it over again and jerk it back. He was flirting with our baby. 
that was so much more interesting than whatever we were talking about. So we quit our conversation and we watched him watch our baby. And then I remember we wondered what his mom thought of all that. She didn't even see it. She was just staring at the floor. At that point, my wife and I made a decision. We took our baby and we laid her face down on Chelsea's chest. Her face fit perfectly in the nape of his long neck. Her little arms dangled around his bony ribs. And we stood closely by because we weren't sure what would happen. And actually the first thing that happened was kind of scary. His arms started doing this. He was having a spasm. He was trying to remember how to use them again. But then he gradually got control and those long scarecrow arms started coming up. And they went up and up. And then they formed an arch over our baby. And then his arms relaxed down around our baby. And as his arms relaxed, his breathing relaxed, and that anguished look on his face was replaced with one of perfect contentment. And I've often said if that's all that had happened that night, it would still be one of the most memorable moments of my life. But one more thing happened. Chelsea spoke, and this time his words made sense. Annie came to see me, Annie, and he smiled. We went home that night, we went to bed. I woke up in the middle of the night with this jolt of energy. I couldn't get back to sleep. Went downstairs and piddled around and then I went on the back steps and sat there with our dog. The sun came up and the phone rang. I ran inside. It was the same friend who had called from the day before. She said, I wanted to call you earlier but I didn't want to wake you which was kind of funny since I'd been up most of the night. But she said, I called to let you know that he died. At 4 a.m., Chelsea died. Now, I've had 30 years to think about this, and I don't think I'll ever understand how a man with advanced dementia awakens and has a moment of perfect clarity and full humanity just hours before he dies. But I know what I believe. What I'll always believe is that it has something to do with the healing power of human touch, human connection, love. I spent most of my adult life in a place where, at least until recently, it was taboo to do what I just did. In academic medicine, we don't tell stories. We give PowerPoint lectures and we write scientific papers. And those are good things. But at some point in my career and in my life, I realized something vital was missing. When I took a closer look at those lectures and papers, I saw some good things and some not so good things. On the good side, they were logical and objective and data driven. On the not so good side, they were logical and objective <laughs> and data driven. And by that point, I realized life doesn't always reduce to numbers and data. It's personalities and emotions and surprises. It's uh, sunsets and friendships and falling in love. It's the joy of a baby's birth and the pain of a friend's death. I also realized that life doesn't always divide up into neat categories. In academia, if they studied Chelsea's case, there might be a section in the epidemiology textbook about part of the story, another section in the psychology textbook about another part, 
and so on. Sociology, maybe ethics, maybe even theology. But that wouldn't be Chelsea or his story. That would just be an abstraction. When we experience life in real time, it's all those things at once. In real time, life is messy and unpredictable. And it's wondrous and amazing. So, how did a data-driven scientist become an emotion-fueled storyteller? And how might my journey be relevant for you? One day, about 10 years ago, my daughter downloaded to my cell phone a podcast, something she thought I'd enjoy listening to. By the way, this is the same daughter, Annie, you met in my story. She was much older by now, and so was I. The podcast was called The Moth, and it featured true personal stories. I found the stories to be absolutely riveting. I was immediately hooked. The Moth became a narrative yin to my academic yang. At first, I was like those people who watch church on TV. You know those people? I, I kept a safe distance. But then one day on KUHF, I heard an announcement that The Moth was coming to Houston. Not the podcast, but a live storytelling program. With the encouragement of friends, I decided not only to go, but to stand up in front of 500 people and tell my story. I still remember walking out on the stage. I was met by this blinding spotlight. I felt disoriented. I began to panic. But as my story unfolded, my eyes adjusted, and I noticed a man in the audience whose body language told me that somehow my story was also his story. We were strangers, but by the end of my story, I felt we had become friends. After the show, he came up to me, along with a couple others, and, we really, and they told me their stories, and we really did become friends. In that moment, I experienced the magic of what stories can do. They can bring people together into friendships and communities. They can encourage and comfort and heal. They can teach us about everything from our values, to our relationships, to the meaning and purpose of our lives. I had gone to the moth that night expecting the storytelling to be entertainment, and it was. But it was so much more. Then came the next morning. I got up early to go to work at MD Anderson. I had a 7 a.m. meeting. I was still bubbling with excitement from the night before. And as I walked into the room, I started to tell my colleagues about it. And then I caught myself. This voice inside my head was booming. You can't talk about that touchy-feely stuff here. Where's your data? <laughs> Would you believe I got that data? It happened by accident, really. The University of Texas system launched an initiative to reduce burnout among faculty physicians. They asked me to review the literature to see what solution, uh, evidence-based solutions might be out there. At the time, there were only two or three solid interventional studies involving physicians. But one of them, to my shock and pleasant surprise, involved a uh, forming a storytelling group among physicians. Now, to be honest, that's not what the authors of the study called it. I think they called it an intervention group. <laughs> but that's exactly what it was. They got the physicians together in small groups every other week, and over a meal, they discussed their work experiences. They told their work stories. And what did the data show? It showed that those who were in the storytelling group, the intervention group, had significant reductions in burnout and stress compared to the other two, basically, control groups. The authors of the study said that it was because telling your stories with your colleagues 
accomplishes two things. It reconnects you with the meaning and purpose of your work, and I would add, and thus your life, and it reconnects you with each other. It helps you feel a part of a supportive community. So my takeaway was, as human beings, two of our most essential needs are meaning and community, and storytelling helps us get both of them. Well, the irony of it all was it was that scientific study that changed my life. I was so excited after I read it that I called the Mayo Clinic and talked to the author on the phone. And we became friends, and we're still friends. After I hung up the phone, I made a decision. I decided to come out of the closet, and I became an unashamed, unabashed, unapologetic, Storyteller. <laughs> I started telling my stories to anybody who would listen. And I also started taking the time to listen to the stories of others. I even started co-hosting a radio show where we do this live on the air. My only regret is that I took so long to start doing it. That story about Chelsea, that goes back to 1987. I kept that story bottled up inside of me for nearly 30 years. Why? Don't be like me. Don't wait until you're 60 years old to give yourself permission to start telling your stories. It doesn't have to be on a stage in front of people, a group, big group of people, or a, with a spotlight in your eye. In fact, it works a whole lot better in natural settings. A hallway at work, over beer after work, at a dog park, over, around the dinner table. The important thing is this. When you dare to tell your stories, tell them with honesty and vulnerability. And if someone wants you to listen to their story, don't just stand there. Listen with full presence and empathy. Remember, it's not just our stories we're sh sharing. It's our lives. If you dare to tell your stories, to share them with your friends, I promise you, you'll receive the same rewards my wife and I received when we shared our baby with our friend. Three things. You'll see miracles and wonders, you'll build your community, and you'll give your souls the nourishment they crave. Thank you.